I wonder if we could just make like police sounds too and no one would notice. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I think they're more aware that police knots exists than Snatcher at this point. Hmm. Cause um I know police knots is on PSN, isn't it? Um I don't know. They put they put they put Snatcher in their they put Snatcher in their new col- in their on their PC engine mini, so Oh, that's right. I, f- I keep forgetting that thing's out. Yeah, yeah. I, it kind of it kind of got delayed because of the you know cause the whole coronavirus thing. Uh, and I feel like they just like one day they were like, "Hey, it's coming out today." And I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, I was <laughs> looking on Amazon during Prime Day and just seeing what they had, and and I stumbled across that, and it's like, oh, available for one day delivery. That's that's. Oh, did you amazing. buy it? No, no. <laughs> how much was it? I don't even know how it's much. A, it's a it hundred bucks. You know? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. That makes uh, sense. I did kind of want it for the Snatcher because that Snatcher ROM is kind of supposed to. It's, it's different because they made changes to it. Yeah, they they adjusted it subtly to to cover up some of the copyright. Yeah, yeah. It's still Japanese though, right? Yep. Yeah. That's a uh, that's a if I get a gift card type thing. Right. Yeah, like it's cool what they did. Playing an adventure game in Japanese does not sound fun for me. I don't know. I'm gonna just go ahead and check out on that one. Hey, I'm Fingers. Hey everyone, this is Days Ahead. And I'm Nitroid. You're listening to the Kojima Frequency. Wait, how long does wait, how, how long would you say a snatcher takes to beat altogether? I mean, if you know what you're doing, you can probably beat it in like three, four hours, I would think. So they say you need eight thousand hours to learn Japanese. So um, eight thousand and four hours to beat snatcher <laughs> doesn't sound <laughs> so bad. And also, <laughs> you have to add additional hours because adventure games, if you don't know what you're doing, can take much exponentially longer than other genres. For sure. Where you don't for know sure. What you're yeah. Doing. When I first played snatcher, it definitely took me a long time. Yeah, you're basically just like you just you can't really like go wrong in snatcher. It's not like King's Quest where you can like not have the right item at a certain point, like get yourself into a. Uh, unsolvable yeah. situation like you can just basically just cycle the dialogue tree and just like keep going through that and you'll you'll make it all right so 8020 hours <laughs> so <that's> just- <laughs> <laughs> on a side note a similar but off topic note i had the weirdest dream this week i think i mentioned it in the group chat i had this dream that i i mean i've been playing integral pretty much all week especially after after nitro you mentioned that all the stuff was unlocked because it's really nice to be able to do the mystery and puzzle stuff without having to do, like, the stealth weapon and special stuff first. Um, yeah, it's tedious. But to that point, I had a dream where, like, you guys know the whole, like, in, in an integral, if... I think it... I've never seen this before, so correct me if I'm wrong. But I heard that if you have a police knots and or snatcher save on the Japanese version of integral... Psycho Mantis calls it out, but then Kojima, like, thanks you for, you know, being such yeah. a supportive patron. I think that's in the original. That's in the original? Yeah, I don't, I mean, it's it's going to be an integral in Japanese version, but I think it's actually in the original version as well in Japanese. Oh, word. Well, in any case, I had a dream that, like, I, I saw the English version of it and nobody had seen it before, which, you know, honestly, with Metal Gear, it, it's... It's plausible that could happen. Well, I mean, there was a lot of content that didn't get ported over when they brought Integral to PC. You know, just for obvious reasons, they didn't bring over the developer comments. You know, your your like very specific video game dream reminds me of the time that I had a nightmare that they announced a new Dark Souls and it had a mini map, and I was so upset. <laughs> like it, 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 it like had a mini map and it had like prompts on the screen like Assassin's Creed, and I was like, no, no. <laughs> counter i like woke up and i was like sweating that's even (laughs) deeper because that's just not only video games but like your fears that is an actual fear i have every time they're like we're working with the new you know new publisher i'm like oh no (laughs) i'm I'm always afraid like when they announced like you know um, sekiro with activision i was like oh no let's see how it goes but it turned out pretty good so you know it'll be funny if they add things like that to the demon souls remake yeah let's not go there you know how i feel about that (laughs) 
<laughs> we'll be here for two hours. Oh, man. I don't remember which which previous episode you guys mentioned this in, but there was something about how, um, you know, just, just the whole idea of, like, Miller dying in his cabin. <laughs> oh, yeah. When I was replaying Peace Walker, I forgot that the, when the game ends, it just, the, the timeline ends, and that it just says, like, you know, 2000 whatever Miller dies. <laughs> it's just like it's just it's on its own and it just just pops up like it's some sort of big like you know big like reveal. And it's like okay and what? <laughs> he dies later, I guess. <laughs> it's it's uh it, it's pretty funny how that shows up cuz the timeline goes away and there's like a stinger kind of sound. It says like 2005 Miller is found dead. Yeah, they're running out of ways to connect it to the later games. Yeah, for me, that's all answered in the Phantom Pain with that phone call or just, you know, that talk between uh, Ocelot and Kaz. Yeah, but that's not going to stop people from trying to figure out, like, exactly what happened and they're going to argue over specifics. And Oh, yeah. We definitely need to dive deeper down that hole. But I think the, the who done it at least, is uh, figured out for sure now. Yeah, I mean, there should be a, you know, a, a, someone should make a fan game where... They tripped in the shower. I would love to do, like, a pseudo, like, true crime episode about Kaz's death. See, what I'm thinking is like, uh, I'm thinking of like a scum style, like Monkey Island style, like point and click adventure game. Oh, shit. You're going to solve who killed Kaz. You're like, um, you're like, oh, um, like Alaska PD. (laughs) No, no, no. Do it like that one. um, Do it like the the one last mystery mission in VR missions where you're in that office room. I was just playing those. Kneeling. Just playing those. All the random clues that don't mean anything like pizza box. You've got. Oh, yeah. Spill bottle of ketchup and. A picture of Kojima, the picture of liquid. Like everything suspicious. Do you guys remember when you first played VR missions, you know, for the first time when it was new? Um, I was, you know, looking forward to, because I had heard, right, on the playground or whatever, that you can play it as the ninja. And I was like, oh, that's going to be cool. And you have, like, what, three missions? Four missions yeah. as the ninja? After, and they're very Yeah, and you have to so grind, like, like, all these other other missions to play. It, yeah, and then and you it, get there, and it's like, it's just three? Yeah, and it's very ho-hum. I think one of them is just chopping, like, wood. Yeah. And... I, yeah, they're very like they build a whole system. They built a whole you know, all these mechanics of how he controls, and you only do two missions really. And I remember being very upset about that because I wanted to, you know, um, you know how they first when they first announced Rising back, um, you know, back then when they had that first trailer. Um, I was in my mind, I was thinking, oh, this is gonna be like a stealth game, like like Tenchu, or it's gonna, you know, you know how Snake is super slow and he crawls around and sneaks. With Raiden, he would be super fast, and he would, like, hide behind stuff. So the stealth would be how fast you can do, you know. I had all these, you know, ideas in my head and how cool that could be. I wasn't, you know, not a big fan of bringing Raiden back, but, hey, if you're going to do it, you know. uh, Yeah, that didn't end up happening, but. Man, now you just uh, made me sad. So all all I'm saying is that Metal Gear has led me down twice when it comes to ninjas and playing as them. (laughs) (laughs) That's, That's why I'm happy with this release of VR missions, because... I can't necessarily be disappointed if I didn't grind to get to these things. Yeah. It, like, yeah, but it, it is crazy they built a whole, like, you know, like a whole thing. Like, he has mechanics. You can do that weird stomp thing, right? Where you can yeah. kind of... Yeah, they have all that crap, and, you know, it's just two missions. And it's, like, surprisingly well thought out, too. Yeah. Because things like the stealth and your your your, like shock freak out move i don't know what you'd call it they all drain his health so you've got to be careful with what you're doing yeah they do i forgot about that yeah and your your health correlates with the score you get so you can't yeah you can't use resources excessively man like nitro and i have talked about this many times but if we had access to just make our like you know use the game to make our own missions or for any of the military games really that's like that would be amazing we could make our own MGS1 missions, MGS2 missions. Just, that, that would be the best. Those would be the best two to, to sandbox in a bit. Yeah. And just experiment. Metal Gear Maker, Metal Gear Maker. Basically, yeah. Dude, if, if you could make like a game like Metal Gear 2, I would just, I, I would do that every day. I would wake up, I would make a Metal Gear, <laughs> I would go to bed. That's what I would do. <laughs> have your choice between different robots at the end. Dude. You have to and fight. You know, and you know I'm going to recreate the NES one and have you blow up a computer or whatever. 
The the only Metal Gear where you're, the final boss is a blue screen. God, it's it's simple enough too that if you wanted to go that route and develop a system, you know, it's I have no doubt that Kojima Productions circa 2001 2002 could do something like that, but it just has never been a priority of theirs to emphasize user generated content. Like they've never cared about that. Yeah. It makes sense and, though, because, uh, oh, sorry, were you done? Well, I was going to say their thing has always been curated experiences, but even with, with Metal Gear Solid five, there was this talk about, I don't know if it was a mistranslation or people just misconstrued it or, or, or misunderstood what, what Kojima was saying, but he made a remark during uh, MGS 5s development about how players could create missions and share them with each other. And I think he meant that in more of like a it, it ended up mean like he meant it in a broader sense of like, hey, can you can you pull this off with these means and and make it through this route? Like he didn't actually mean you were creating missions, but it got yeah. a lot of people thinking like that's what he was planning. And there was even footage that they were showing off of like the Fox Engine editor where they were like on the fly making new maps and it was just really cool. I do remember that video where they were showing just like how easy it was for them to create terrain and just like yeah, how, just like yeah, that's that's what I remember. I, I was like, oh, cool, this will be used by a lot of developers, and then and then it it came out. We talked about that in another episode where it's just like that was actually a really hard to use tool. Yeah, yeah, uh, it, yeah. It's actually there are some people who have been making mods and tools to for people to create their own MGS for uh, missions and levels and stuff. But it's not to the point where anyone can do it, from what I understand. It's a bit, it's a bit complicated. In MGS Five. Yeah, you essentially have to be like a Unity developer. I do know Adam Online was uh, saying that he was like working on, you know, all those custom missions and stuff and setting them up. So on the Snake Soup, we have like reported, you know, back when we were doing that uh, on on the work he was doing, and I was looking at that, and yeah, that was pretty cool because um, MGS Four has. You know, so, uh, like I, I really enjoy MGS4's gameplay, like the you know the minute to minute gameplay when you're on the field and doing all the stuff. Yeah, it's one of the best experiences I've had playing a game, and I would just I didn't want the missions to end, you know, like I would love just an extension of like different kind of missions that were well designed because yeah, you can do the side missions, but they get repetitive, right? They're not enjoyable. Um, not to interject, but but did you mean MGS5? What did I say? Four. MGS4. Yeah, uh, okay, I'm going to go kill myself now. I could feel Nitroid's <laughs> blood boiling from here, dude. Oh, no. Like, uh, that, was, I think, that was a powerful <laughs> force in the universe just now. No, Jesus. I, oh, yeah, you no, good? because... No, because... Be all right. you don't, all yeah, right. you don't understand. I think if we had a competition, uh, our take on MGS4, me and Nitroid, I think we would either be equal or... Uh, yeah, no, I can't believe I said that. I'm, I'm ashamed. Uh... <laughs> I'm going to sit there thinking like MGS4 50 lashes, is fun. 50 lashes I like it. For me. I like the actual gameplay of it. Like when you're oh, on no, the field so, and stuff, that's good stuff for MGS4. No, sorry. I, if you no, want to I talk mean, shit MG- about the meta and the story and what it represents and all that, but I, I didn't think for what it, for what it was, that that was a bad gameplay system. Then MGS5 came out and shit all over it. But I'm just saying at the time that was pretty damn good for what it was. Dude, I've already got a headache. <laughs> yeah, I would. Yeah, I would. I would disagree. I'm with Nitroid. I don't like that MGS4's gameplay at all. Is it? I, I think just the Octo Camo? Is that the main thing that you don't like? I just, I just don't like the game design itself. How okay. the levels are structured and how you know you're not, you know the the like. I understand why you had you know from a meta point of view, right? You had access to all these weapons because Kojima was like, oh look, you know, like oh PMCs, the, you know, the war economy. Okay. Um, but it didn't translate well for me into the game. I, I mean, I have much broader issues with MGS4 that are way far and beyond what I could say within this context. I pretty much just used the same weapons anyway, so, like, that wasn't a huge thing for me, I guess. I Like, I didn't... Like, I bought pretty much fucking everything, but that, I just kind of stuck with the same couple of guns for the most part. Yeah, on, I would say on the Snake Soup, we have many articles <laughs> that cover um, <laughs> this topic of our uh, disdain... Yeah, for MGS4 in general as a concept, as for his existence, um, we uh, I don't like MGS4 for having the audacity to exist. Yeah, for, yeah, um, yeah. No, there are things I appreciate about it on a very um, technical level. Sure, you know, you can you can really hate something, but say, oh yeah, that looks cool. You know, so there's some things like that in MGS4. But when I see those things, I'm always upset. Man, those could have been used in a better way. You know, there's some designs I really like uh, in that game. I really like how the geckos look, for example. I like that they look like those DARPA things. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, know. the work that was put into it is high quality, and and yes. I agree that I enjoy the gameplay. But I think the word that that was I was thinking of is is like over curated, in a sense that it it the example you gave was perfect, where you know it was supposed to convey the war economy with the whole Drebin system and the Drebin points. But at the same time, I don't even want to call it ludo narrative dissonance because I don't. That's not necessarily what it is. It's sort of like in a movie when when you watch a movie that that's sort of high concept and they try to make some. They, they almost like make plot holes to make their message work. That's how I felt with the game. Some of the gameplay ideas with Metal Gear Solid Four. Like I see what they were going for with the idea. Yeah, but the execution it the execution directly con- conflicts with the experience. You know, For it's sure. it's like okay, you made a you made a clever point that doesn't mean it's good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, <laughs> clever point doesn't necessarily translate well into playing the game, and that's how I feel about that game. Um, that being said, sometimes it's over curation works because I I, I do remember very distinct moments. Um, I was a sucker for the, the microwave scene, no matter how like emotionally contrived it was. Um, I really enjoyed the area in Chapter 5, like that first area where you have to dodge like the frogs and everything. So, you know, there are some places where like there are flashes of brilliance, I feel. But it's in between. It's, it's in between a lot of other things. Yeah, like, like I said, there's a lot of good things I can say about the game. The, the bad for me outweighs the good. Uh, I, I I honestly, you know, consider MGS4 kind of like a low point in the series in terms of uh, narrative and a lot of things. But I also, you know, you can't deny that that's the game Kojima wanted to make at that point. You know, and even if I dislike it, I was like, you know what? He did what he wanted to do. You know, I'd rather have that than him just remake the same game again. You know, like MGS4 is very different from what came before it. And, uh, you know, and that's maybe that's a good thing. It didn't, I didn't like it, but I'd rather have Kojima do something different and be experimental. What, what, even if it, in my opinion, failed, than him, you know, do the same thing over and over. Because for the most part, for, all the way from Metal Gear 1 to MGS3, the format didn't change a lot. Yeah, Futurist Sound put out one of uh, put out a video recently, actually, kind of talking about this exact subject about how it was kind of more about the fans, kind of accepting the death of the series, and like you know, it was it was like this big contrived message that just when viewed it as a game was just kind of like, wait, what? Yeah, so. I saw that or that video, and y- <sighs> I thought that was the most aligned video of his with uh, your opinion so far, Nitroid, By the way, well. I was like, Nitro to like this one. <laughs> well, here's here's my thing, and, and I don't mean I watched it, and I don't mean any disrespect to Future of Sound, but it just seemed very much like a rehash of the same "it sucks on purpose" argument that I've heard a billion times. Yeah. And okay, it sucks on purpose, but it still sucks. Yeah. Yeah, I would. Yeah, I would have to agree with Nitro there. You're not gonna move me on my dislike of MGS4. It's not. Like, gonna I got happen. it. It's been many. It's been. It's been many years. Many people have tried. Yeah. Um, you know, um, the the weirdest criticism I got for my opinion, which I'm still thinking about to this day. Sometimes, you know, I was talking to someone about MGS4 for some reason, and I mean they brought it up, and um, I was like, yeah, I don't really like that game, and we brought up something else, whatever, and he said, you know, I think you don't like MGS4 because. Because you you like linear games, and I'm like, I don't even know what to do with this opinion. <laughs> MGS4 is the MGS4 most is pretty linear. It's, it's the, game, else, but... the game is literally go f- like, hey, yeah. look at your map. Go to point A. Go to yeah. point B. The game. Yeah. Take lane A or lane B to get there. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's basically like a, like a hallway game in yep. many ways. So you know, yeah, and that was it's just a bad argument. Yeah, I know. I didn't say anything. I was like, yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, whatever you say. So those things, you just got to, like, nod your head. It's just too much energy. Probably had the best response to the same guy, I believe. And, you know, shout out to the guy if he's listening. I doubt he is. But uh, where the guy turned to Ravi and asked, you know, like, what do you think about Metal Gear? And Ravi said, huh, Metal Slug? And he was like, oh, never mind. <laughs> and he's, he went away. And I was like, that was, that was the best way to get rid of this guy. <laughs> Holy shit. That's awesome. Yeah, shout out to Ravi from the Snake Soup. And today we do have Maxwell N from the snakesoup.org, uh, current editor in chief. It's been a long time contributor and 
been taking care of stuff on their social media for a while. It's been how, how long have you been doing the snake soup, Max? <sighs> That's hard to quantify. I guess directly ten years. Ten uh, years. But indirectly, I've been around for a while. Um, I took more charge in doing things, being more upfront about it in the past few years, more so. But usually, I was like more behind the scenes, and um, and I started writing articles for the site because it used to just be Ravi who used to write the articles. Mm-hmm. Um, I started writing them. I don't know when the first one was. It must have been like five or six years ago. That's when I started writing them. Maybe earlier. Um, I think the first one I ever wrote was just talking about MGS1 very, you know, just uh, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I sometimes forget. And you just put out a new article, too. Yeah, one of the myth articles where you guys basically take a, a you know, a, a misconception that people have about something related to Metal Gear or Kojima games, and then you sort of break it down and debunk it. Yeah, that was one of the first... Uh, big things that the snakes have started doing back when Robbie started where, you know, that's the, that's the kind of the uh, theme we have running through our whole site and our whole, I guess, mission, if you want to call it, is just to kind of try to hold people's weird opinions accountable. People say a lot of weird crap online. So, you know, we want to be kind of not exactly fact checkers, but say, Hey, you know, that's not true because of this, you know, Um, one of the first ones that, I believe Ravi did, that's kind of mythical at this point, was the debate on, you know, early 2000s online forums that Raiden doesn't have a dick. <laughs> Which is the dumbest thing. <laughs> These are the important questions, though, man. We gotta- like the exactly. fact that you even have to debate this. Exactly, but those are the kind of things that we were up against. We, we started seeing those so much, and I still do, right? Just people just saying stuff, and it's like, well, that's not true. And having an article where you can just link them and say, hey, you know, look at this. Yeah. That helps a lot. So that's kind of the impetus behind that, I suppose. Uh, just being just being frustrated with 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 people on, on forums. That's where it comes from. That's a that's an endless rabbit hole. I've always really appreciated the site. You know, I always send people to the snakesoup.org when, you know, I'm just sitting there trying to just admin my solid snake page on Facebook and people are just Blah, 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 blah. Snake had blonde hair before. And I'm just like, nope, shut up. And I just, you know, link them that, uh, that brown hair myth link over on the snake soup. And yeah, and that's it old. Shuts them right that's off. an old one. That, that must be from 2000, 2005, I think. It's a classic. Yes. That argument still pops up, too. It just I saw, it, I saw it pop up, like, uh, this year, I think. Yeah. Oh, it, it pops up every year. <laughs> because Shinkawa made, like, an offhand remark one time. And a a little bit of concept art where he's just kind of screwing around. Yeah, that's also a big problem I see in a lot of things where people use concept art as a way to justify things. Like, yeah, you 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 wouldn't justify something that I did in a book based on a draft I wrote five months ago. That's not how it works. Like, that's a great way to put it. The 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 finished product is the finished product. Like, as someone who writes a lot, because I I use a writing example because that's what I do. You know, I I make so many changes when I'm writing. Like a character's entire purpose might change. You can look at something I wrote ages ago where that character was like something else completely and I reused the name or you reused a concept and just say, well, you know, five months ago he wrote a draft where it's like, you know, um, if you look at Tolkien's work, right? Just as an example of someone who did that a lot. Uh, it's very hard to decipher his drafts because he would literally change the name of the characters while he was writing because he would just try out the names. And he would like reuse names. So if you look at his script, the same character, or sorry, his draft, his, the same character might have like five different names just because he was like, I don't know, I changed my mind. <laughs> That's, That's a cooler name. I can appreciate that though, for sure. There's always going to be like that one fan who's like, well, actually, if you string all five of them together, that's the real name. Yeah. I mean, you know, as someone who's super into the Soul series, that's something that I'm very annoyed by the amount of YouTube channels that, you know, want to theory craft. And, you know, you can do that on your own time. But the people who, uh, you know, claim that they have the answer, it's like, this yeah. is the answer. I found the, the, the answer in the files. This character was actually named this.png. Therefore, it's like, no, just stop. That's not how it works. Well, another an example of that in Metal Gear is how, you know, go to the, the Metal Gear wiki and oh you can see like they <laughs> like they'll list one of Big Boss's nicknames as as Saladin. Yep. Completely misunderstanding what that line was. Yeah, and, <laughs> the, 
the the Melgar wiki also does this red they, they love retcons over there or they love like that like that kind of stuff so i believe it says that venom snake's first appearance was in the 80s in Metal Gear. And it's like uh, uh, uh not exactly <laughs> not really <laughs> you can't say that <laughs> I mean, I guess if you're going by the retcon, which uh, I would argue is not even a retcon, it's more of like a meta, like, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. It's like, it's it's up in the air if MGS5 is even a retcon or if it's just Kojima talking to the fans. And, you know, the fact that the series is over, or at least Kojima's series is over, you know, it, I don't think it really matters at this point. But yeah, you can't say that Venom Snake was a character introduced in the 80s. That's just factually incorrect. <laughs> I mean, these are the guys who like to play it in chronological order, so. Yeah, which is not something I, I uh, that, uh, that's just disgusting. Our, our discussion kind of borders on, like, death of the author, right? And it's funny because we had a whole podcast episode dedicated to that concept in relation to, like, breaking video games. Sort of like you just described, like, hey, you know, there's a PNG file with this name, therefore this. Yeah. Um, and that whole discussion actually started from one of the Mythbusters articles about, like, oh, did Snake have a good shot at saving Emma? Like, that was the whole... Okay, beginning. okay, real quick. Oh, boy. I gotta, oh, I gotta boy. interject here. Do you remember when I mentioned during that podcast about I, how I, I got was, into it? I was so mad. I was so mad when you were talking let me, about that. Let me... <laughs> yeah, I know you were. I know. You remember how I mentioned that there was a friend that kind of took me to task on this when I brought it up? Welcome, Maxwell. <laughs> that was That was Max. Oh boy. In fact, in fact, often, often when Nitroid says a friend, like when he does the Joe Rogan buddy of mine thing, yeah, that's like that's often that's me. <laughs> it's either it's either you or, or our other friend John. Yeah, but it's like whenever he's like you know a buddy of mine, I'm like oh he's gonna say something I said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have uh, I've kind of recanted on that position because uh, yeah, I can't really justifiably argue it. We have an article on our site which. Is kind of con- I don't know I I, I don't, I don't th- it's one of our articles that I don't think everyone agrees with, and it actually goes back on something we said earlier. So back in the early Snake Soup, we had actually been on the stance that Snake did have a good shot, but after some research and looking into it and looking into how the scene is presented within the context of the game itself, not using external logic, right? Because gameplay logic and cutscene logic are two very different things. You can't do that. Um, but by using that, we kind of, you know, came to the conclusion that Snake did not have a good shot, actually. Yeah, and that was the thing. It wasn't necessarily, you know, the, our argument between you and I wasn't necessarily whether he did or didn't have a good shot. It was that my reasoning was flawed for saying it. I suppose. Um, you know, it's one of those things where I, I can't believe we're having this discussion because it's so, like, Dumb I know. At, at a certain point, it's like, but <laughs> I'm, but I'm people, sorry. People, no, 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 no. I'm not. I'm saying we're dumb. I'm not saying you're dumb. I'm saying we're dumb because we're right. debating about a game from 2001 where a guy. He's not from, laughing at you. He's laughing with you. Exactly. Oh, I'm okay, laugh, okay. I'm laughing at myself because I because I we wrote the article, <laughs> like we published it, so <laughs> we're part of the problem. But um, but no, you know, it's one of those things that's always talked about and. Um, yeah, if you go read that article, I think it's a good argument why he did and how the and how the in fact a big issue is how the game communicates that. Because Snake does say, what does he say? He says damn or something, you know, Snake line whatever. Um when that happens and um in fact there was a there was a long discussion on some old forum, I don't remember. That was what started us rethinking that and there were a bunch of people like discussing like um from a more gun point of view, you know, these were people who knew about bullets and guns and stuff and how they were talking about how Snake wouldn't have a good shot because of his angle and all that, you know, it was, it kind of became very JFK how they were talking about it. But, <laughs> the grassy um, knoll of Big Show. <laughs> exactly. And um, that's kind of what I like about Metal Gear because you never know how much Kojima thought about it, right? Because Kojima really does think about those things. That's one of the things, right? He's not, he is one of those people where sometimes he'll be like, and eh, don't worry about it. And, but sometimes you know that he put thought into it more than he should, right? Yeah, just the codec exposition is like enough to prove that. Yeah, you know, and I feel like often a big issue with Metal Gear is people confuse cutscene logic and gameplay logic, where you know things that happen within a cutscene don't happen in the gameplay, right? In the cutscene world, does Snake actually believe in Santa? He's real, I tell you. He used to bring me presents and 
or is that just like a throw? You know what I mean? Like uh, uh, Metal Gear has a really weird interpretation of uh, like a floating cannon. Where, like if the colonel says, you know, press the select button, is exactly. Snake actually pressing a select button? I'm like, no, of course he's not. Yeah, so that's always for me that that scene is like the peak of that where something that's happening in the gameplay isn't necessarily what's happening in the cutscene, but it's such an important story moment that it's very confusing. And um and I think it could have been communicated better. Snake could have just said, you know, when you call him on the codec, I don't have a good shot, Raiden. He could have said that, right? Uh, but he didn't. Instead, he said dot dot dot. <laughs> so <laughs> that is that is confusing. Kojima knew what he was doing. He was like, "I'm gonna leave it at dot dot dot. Let these fuckers fight about it for decades." Maybe Snake just didn't like Emma. Maybe he was jealous. He really loves Otacon. You know, <laughs> he's like, "Oh, she's gonna show up." You know, getting a little, getting a little too much attention over there. I don't want to share Hal. You know. Oh yeah, I I, I didn't have a good shot. Oops. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> uh, you know. Um, Plus the whole fact that Vamp could just, you know, use his superhuman reflexes to just exactly that's a big, ugh, it's a host- shove it's a hostage. right there and go human shield and just you know it's a it's a it's a hostage situation is the yeah. uh, problem with that scene. Like Snake has a good shot, but he might hurt Emma. Yeah, Vamp wants a jet and a million dollars. Snake doesn't want a Ruby Ridge big shell, <laughs> so y'all are like kicking into my childhood right now because I definitely peruse this website as a kid way too much well so did i so did i right i wasn't part of it of its found of its founding that was ravi and so i was also a kid who was on the side um you know and i remember really liking the site because the sense of humor and everything because there was no other site like that right we like ravi kind of invented shit posting for metal gear before that was a thing mm-hmm. um you know, we had there were just articles like five dumbest things in Metal Gear Solid Three, and they were just all just shit posts for the most part. Um, it's funny how shit posting became a thing, and there are all these like you know Facebook pages that shit posting. Like we've been doing this <laughs> for bordering on twenty years. So what was the uh, the recent one about Metal Gear Solid remakes that you guys did, where we ju- we should just keep remaking them or something? Oh, oh, that was the April Fool's thing. So yeah, like, um, I can't speak for Ravi 100%, but both of us uh, dislike the concept of remakes as just as a concept in culture. And, uh, you know, and we're very much against the idea of, you know, remaking Metal Gear games, especially. Um, And so, yeah, we had an article where, uh, for April Fool's, we just uh, drew it. It was like an April Fool's article where a, a, a guy joined our website you know, I'm not saying if he's real or not. His name is Saul Ed Snake. And um, Saul Ed Snake thinks that we need remakes because we should remake everything. Like, we should remake Bowie albums. We should remake, uh, we should just remake everything, you know. I, I don't want to listen to the same albums I've been listening to for 30 years. I want the album again. Let's remake it. So, yeah, that's that's our, that was our kind of jab at people who, uh, <laughs> for some reason, can't play games when they're over five years old. So I can appreciate like a remaster, though. I can I can appreciate. Oh, of course, remasters know. are. Rema- I mean, uh, within within reasonable, you know, some remasters yeah. kind of go f- too far, where yeah. they're like, we're going to change some mechanics, like you know, like how the Dark Souls remake um, had, does things that sure. and like, um, or sorry, uh, not a remake, the remaster where they added an extra bonfire. I'm like, eh, don't do that. Uh, you know, stuff like that. But for the most part, yeah, no remasters. Uh, that's what I want, right? I want good remasters. I, I want them on everything on a Switch. On a PlayStation, on a PC, it just put them everywhere. Just flood the flood the world with re- remasters, so, that, so we can kind of. Uh, I'm not sure if you can call it preserving, but in, in a way, it is preserving. You know, true preservation would be something like GOG, right? Where it, it would be like DRM free. That's that's true preservation, in my opinion. Yeah, but, and that's the reason I don't give them much crap for the problems in MGS One and Two PC because well, it's not really their fault, right? They did the best they could. Those weren't their <laughs> problems, exactly. Yeah. They're just putting it out there and making it available, and so that's a piece of the history that now you can get untouched, essentially. Also, they expect that people online will fix it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, their job is to just to get it in our hands, and then we can, like, like, people don't understand how big of an achievement it is to convince Konami to do this. That alone is, like, a victory that we should be celebrating. Oh, yeah, you know, I don't even have, want to know what kind of red tape they went to to get, to get those up. I'm very confused, very, very confused why Metal Gear 2 isn't in there. 
I remember when the, the when the rumors were first coming out, I'm like, what? They're just gonna leave out Metal Gear 2? That makes no sense. <laughs> that's that's weird, but they did, and you know, they may not have wanted to take on like everything at once. You know, maybe I, I don't it just, know. It's just really like, strange. You have to yeah. admit, it's really strange. I have it a theory. Is. I have a theory that they didn't want to confuse people with MG2 and MGS2. It's a dumb theory, maybe, but I don't. I don't know. Maybe it's true. Um, I think it's a good enough game to just come out by itself and then be like, dude, oh yeah, yeah there's no, this one you, too. Like, I'll, I'll take yeah. that. I don't, you know. Metal Gear 2 is probably tied with Metal Gear Solid as my favorite Metal Gear game. I'll, I'll agree with you on that one, buddy. Cheers. Yep. Yeah, and um, I'm very proud of the Snake Soup for starting the Running Man thing. Um, <laughs> yeah. The originator of the Running Man meme. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that took off. It was a slow yeah. burn, but it got there. I wanted that. He's been my hero since I was a kid. I was a little baby, and I had a poster. No, I had a poster of Running Man. I was like, one day, I, I too can run fast. <laughs> Sonic who? Yeah, oh, Sonic. Oh yeah, get out of here, Sonic. Running Man just does. He, he like needs rings and stuff. Like yeah. Running Man doesn't need rings. He just needs the road ahead of him. And also, can Sonic run and plant bombs at the same time? Probably not. And can he also live in a gas chamber for some reason? Nah, he like chokes underwater, little bitch. Yeah, exactly. I think Running Man could probably just breathe underwater. I'm pretty sure he could. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he's got a mask. So he's he can. Fine. He can. He can outrun oxygen. Probably. You know. He doesn't. He's so fast. He doesn't even need to breathe. <laughs> it's still amazing to me that of all the names they changed in Metal Gear Two, that was one of the few that they didn't. Oh, I'm so glad they didn't because. They probably tried to change it, but like it just changed itself back. It was too strong. Like they probably changed it to something else. And but when they poured the game, they tried. Yeah, when they poured the game, the code just changed. It just became Running Man. It was too strong, and they're like, "Oh crap, we got to leave this alone. We're tapping into some weird voodoo. Like we don't want to mess with Running Man." He outran Revision. Yeah, exactly. He was Only too Metal fast. Gear boss to have a uh, dance named after him. So. <laughs> he was he was he was too fast they couldn't board him we need a dance called the fat man funny that you mentioned remakes because that was kind of like light bulb in my head as far as the articles that i was looking for um and that was mostly uh the articles related to twin snakes oh boy it was man. sort of like a like a prequel prequel review moment for me like everybody talks about red letter media and the prequel reviews and how that was kind of their somebody finally explained to them why the prequels just didn't work in their brain. Me, you know, being a, you know, a hormone driven teenager, I, I didn't like twin snakes, but I didn't understand why I didn't like twin snakes. Yeah. Um, and you know, snake soup just kind of stepped in and, and gave me that explanation, which opened me up to the, the rest of the website. Yeah. Yeah. I can't take credit for that. That was Robbie, but for sure. Um, I didn't play Snake. Uh, sorry, um, I didn't play Twin Snakes uh, growing up. I didn't have a GameCube. So um, I did play. I mean, I played. So my history with Metal Gear is that I played Metal Gear Solid 1, the, you know, Metal Gear Solid 1, the first, like a lot of people. I played that in like the late 90s when it came out. And, um, and then, you know, l- later on, I went back and played the other games, which I think is pretty typical. That's how most people in the West at least discovered uh, Metal yeah. Gear, the series. Um, my introduction to Metal Gear Solid was weird because. Um, do you, are you guys familiar with the E3997 trailer for Metal Gear Solid? It's the weirdest yeah. trailer. It's Is that, that the trailer. one with the CG cutscenes? No, or no, the no. FMVs? So that's, no, uh, that trailer has a whole story that does not exist in the game, where if you follow the story of that game, Snake goes around Shadow Moses and meets Meryl. At some point, they rig up the entire Shadow Moses facility like you know with c4s with like c4 bombs and they blow it all up oh yeah doesn't it end with like just oh, a right. scene of like the, the the c4 going around the base exactly and it has a whole story and there's one point where meryl and snake are back to back shooting you know they're just shooting da, 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 and they're just like back to back and it nothing like the game <laughs> at all but it did its job then i was interested and i remember being a dumb kid and being like is this a movie you know, I was so, you know, as a kid, I've never seen anything like that. And um, once I had a PlayStation, because I was, you know, with, I mean, I had a Sega Genesis for a long time. I didn't get a PlayStation until later on, uh, like in the late, late 90s. And uh, that was one of the first games I played on there. And I was hooked, you know. 
um, I remember it took me like a long time to beat that game because I never I was a young kid. I never played anything like that. And, you know, so I, I had that whole experience where it's like, oh, look, like, you know, her um, Meryl's codec is uh, on the CD case. I'm like, what? Wow. <laughs> Well, it's yeah, nobody had been doing case. things like that. Yeah, you know, exactly. That was, now it's everywhere, but but at the time, that was really the first mainstream title that was kind of screwing with the medium like that, well, outside of only, maybe Earthbound. I was going to say the only game I can think of that does that uh, are the first two Monkey Island games. Um, they're very meta like that. Um, oh, yeah. Mon- Monkey Island 2 is MemGS2 in many ways. They have a lot of similarities, where the second game is more of like a commentary on the first game, and it kind of you know like i'm i don't i'm not i'm gonna say anything more because there are a lot of people who haven't played it and i would encourage people to play that because that game has a whole story like a meta story to it that if you even say it remotely you have to play one and then two you know and it, if, if you play one and two together especially these days because you can do that uh, it has a really cool effect at how it ends and everything and then the series went on and just destroyed the whole point <laughs> just like metal gear um <laughs> Dude, I had no idea that Monkey Island had that, like, I, I've never looked at it from that kind of level. I've just, like, played them, and it was kind of this, like, self-aware adventure game, but yeah, I didn't know that it was that deep on it. The first one was definitely, the first one was self-aware, but it was self-aware and, like, more like a wink-wink nudge, nudge this is a yeah. game. But the second one is takes that on a much bigger and much, in a sense, deeper level, and uh, it's a really cool idea how that game yeah. does it. it I really, played it a long time ago, so... I might just need to revisit it. I still laugh at, um, spo- spoiler if you haven't played Monkey Island, so skip ahead 20 seconds, but it still kills me that at the end of the game, one of the lines is, uh, you know, you get to kind of decide what the the last line of the game is going to be, and one of them is never pay more than $20 for a video game. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Guybrush is looking very heroically in the distance and you can pick, yeah, your own like kind of like kind of badass line to say at the end. And one of them, the, yeah, one of the choices is that. <laughs> um, uh, I really, really dislike the remake of that game, but the good thing oh, about... It's awful looking. But the good thing about the remakes is that I don't know technically how they did it. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not a game dev. But they did it somehow where it's like the Halo remasters or sorry, remakes, where pseudo remakes where... Uh, you can press a button and switch to the old version of the game at any point. And uh, so, yeah, the Monkey Island games, when you play when you buy the, I think they're called Special Edition, they have, like, the new graphics, and I don't like them at all, but you can just press, like, I don't know, F2 or whatever. And it switches yeah, they did the to, same thing in um, Day of the Tentacle, too, where you can switch back and forth. Oh, did they? I didn't realize that, because yeah. I, I looked at the remaster, and I was like, yeah, I don't like how this looks, but if they did that, then I'm more inclined to buy that. Sure, that's cool. I need to play through Maniac Mansion again. Yeah, dude, all those scum games, those um, Lucas Arts. I love games, that like, era of Lucas Arts games. Um, yeah. Indiana Jones and the F- and the Fate of the Atlantis was like my first. Scum oh, I love game, that I game. And that game is so good. I like it more than most of the movies, <laughs> honestly. And uh, I was not a big Indiana Jones fan as a kid, so I didn't play it for that reason, right? I just played it because it was a game, and uh, it was, it's such a cool game. It's very um, it's very obtuse. You really do need a guide. Uh, yeah, that's the thing with adventure games. It's all this fucking moon logic, and you're just like, what? Yeah, um, Monkey Island kind of plays with that moon logic. There's a few solutions that are very out of the box where it's almost like, like I said, it's more of a meta thing. Mm-hmm. Where there, You know how those, the scum games have that whole mechanic of like look at, talk to, and whatever. Sure. And Monkey Island really plays with that. Like I, this, is yeah. not an, this is not an actual thing, but it would be something like if you pick talk to and you pressed on a tree, and it's talk to tree, and that's the solution. Because yeah. there's something in the tree. They play with that. A lot. Sam and Max did uh, hit the road. Was another game that that was very aware of how goofy the mechanics were. Yeah, I was I was thinking about this like kind of like a shower thought the other day, and I was wondering if like you know in a few decades from now, you know, provided that the Earth like survives or humanity or whatever, um, are we gonna have like art? Are we gonna have art history about video games? Sort of like you know, a good example is you know these adventure games where okay, well you know. They had small dev teams and they had to make this game last as long as possible. So we had concepts like moon logic and, and, and you had to use a guide to make it work and live so that, you know, if people failed, they had to restart the game all over. Like, are these things well, we're going to look at as a reflection of the industry and, you know, are, are my grandkids going to have art history classes on it? Well, you know, that's a so that's something that's relevant to me. I, I was like art, art history was my like academic thing for a while. 
And uh, I don't, I'm not as hopeful at how that will be portrayed. I'm very much in odds with how the gaming industry is in terms of, you know, at its core, the gaming industry is like a toy industry, right? For better or for worse. And there's, there's definitely like a thing in video games where people want to promote the fact that it's art. It, you know, it can be art as well. You know, people like Kojima made that possible, right? But I still feel like video games are still stuck on this level and it's through just the people selling games and people buying games where it's very difficult to see them out the context of them not being toys anymore. I almost feel like games being art has been kind of co-opted by corp- like you know corporations who are like, oh yeah, our game is artistic. We have artistic toys and it's very contrived. And I'm, I'm not very, you know, I, I would hope it's seen in that context, but I don't, when I, when I look around and I look at around the gaming culture, I, you know, you can separate like, Art has always been about commerce. That's how it all survived. But video games are a bit different because they're more of a product that anyone can buy. And they have to play to that, right? They, they, are, they are art for sure because there's many artistic elements that go into games. But the finished product is more of just a thing you buy off a shelf, not, not so, too similar. Sorry, go ahead. My, well, I was going to say, my question then is, why is it that movies were able to overcome that barrier but I would I would say they have, and honestly, I think they 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 did for a while. And I I feel I personally feel like you know I'm just speaking for myself, but I personally feel like they've like regressed, um, you know, especially with you know the whole Disneyfication of everything recently. I feel like movies have kind of regressed in that regard. Um, the good thing about movies and games is that there's like you know different mainstreams, right? So you can have people making cool indie games, or you know they're kind of removed from that. Um, yeah, it doesn't have to just be a huge AAA to necessarily. Exactly, I yeah. I'm, I get very tired of AAA uh, games that all look the same, promoting yeah. the fact that they're. That's been that, the, that's been like my big thing this year. Is I'm just like fuck. I'm so just sick of everything that's kind of coming out lately. Okay. I've been yeah. having way more fun with the indie stuff and. Don't call me a dork here, but that's when I refer to like art history. Like that's sort of what I'm also referring to in a sense that. Yeah. Like, yeah, you're, you're, you're absolutely correct in that, you know, we shouldn't have to debate all day of whether video games are art or not. And at the end of the day, yes, they're a product that's meant to be consumed. But me personally, I am interested in companies try to maximize that, that profit while also working with the developers to build this, this piece of art or tool or media or whatever you want to call it and how that's influenced by, you know, all of those factors. So like, for instance, when you guys say, oh man, AAA games, they tend to be the same. That's been a very, a very common trope in in the industry for a while, right? But if you said that in I don't know two thousand eight, we'd probably be complaining about everything looking all deserty and like everything looking like Call of Duty. And you know, if we made that complaint now, we'd probably be talking about you know how everything is a games as a service, everything needs loot, and everything needs loot boxes. And I don't know. I think it's interesting how yeah we're going through phases of it yeah. for sure. I see what you're saying. When I when I say something I've noticed recently, I don't mean like this year. This is something that I became very aware of in like the mid two thousands, because in, in the mid two thousands when I lost like a lot of interest in video games, I had a huge span of time where I was like, man, video games suck. They all you know, I think I bought a PS3 and then I played the first Assassin's Creed now, and I was like, if this is what game, if this is what ga- games are supposed to be, I'm not interested. This is just not my thing. Um, and then I played MGS4, and then I went into a deep depression. But, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I, what what brought me out of that is how my like I was saying, there's different. I feel like there was a time it, it was a, similar for a lot of industries where you could only have one mainstream. But as time went on, as internet grew. Uh, we have way more opportunities in music and everything where, yeah, you have the people on top and you have that industry on top, but you have so much stuff that's below it and it's the different layers of it. You could be a very popular musician yet still be unheard of. Sure. Uh, you know, and I think that's pretty cool. And for me, that was like um, in 2009 when Demon Souls came out. I remember that was a big moment for me where I was like, oh, OK, people are making different games. And Demon Souls at the time was very much like a big, you know, fuck you to... All the games at the time, they were very handholdy, right? Every single game at the time was just like, go over here, go over there, do this mission, do that. It had become very complacent. So I feel like that game came out at a really good time. But I digress. My whole point is that, yeah, I, I agree that you can make that complaint at any point in time in history. You could go back in the 50s and say all the music is just the same, you know, do up, you know. But I feel like it's a bit different now because I feel like corporations have kind of co-opted 
that they are art- they are artistic. They really like use the art narrative. Like, do you guys have you have you guys ever seen that Death Stranding trailer for Sony with the guy crying? It's one of the most hilarious things I've ever seen in my life. Where um, oh the commercial, yeah. There's a commercial where this guy who looks like a you know a typical gamer, uh, you know, uh, like a like a. When I say that, I just mean like the mo- the, the the commercial sense of that, right? Right. Just like a good looking guy, and but you know he's like good looking. He's very broy. You know he's sitting there and he's playing Dead Stranding, and on the <laughs> okay, it's it's an effort PlayStation Pro, and he's playing Dead Stranding, and on the screen Norman Reedus is holding a baby and crying. And they pan to his face and his eyes, and he's crying. He has a teardrop growing, and the screen just says PlayStation Pro. <laughs> and it's one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life, where this kind of contrived sense of, oh, this is a deep, sad game. It's artistic. It's being used in a very like superficial way to sell a product. And I've seen that a lot, where I feel like the artisticness of games is almost like a co-opted thing, where it's like it's almost like a feature, like a bullet point on the back of a box. Where it's like, this game is artistic. It's like, if you say it, then it's not. If you have to say it, then... But yeah, no, I, I remember I retweeted that and I said something like, when they ask you if you have a PlayStation Pro, but they don't ask you how you're doing, bro. <laughs> 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 this, this dude is just sitting by himself looking at Norman Reedus crying. He's like, he's crying? I'm crying too. It's just like me. <laughs> As far as the whole, like, uh, games and art history thing, I feel like it's kind of just up to, like, just documenting it. And, ha- like, the the documentaries that are out uh, on Netflix right now, there's that high score one. Yeah. Uh, that's got some, like, pretty cool, like, just little individual stories about small teams and kind of what they've gone through. And it's just, like, mm-hmm. we just got to keep r- recording stuff that way and just passing on the information. But I don't know if it'll – it probably won't be taught in school that way. Um, maybe not, maybe not, but I, I'm But really it's glad. cool for us as the hobby, like, as for the people that are into the hobby to, like, keep track of that information and pass it on in ways, write books, you know, to, you know, just make documentaries and stuff like that. Okay, solid snakes. <laughs> you got me there. As, as far as education, my, my extent to that is probably going to be, like, a, an elective art course that's sent in, like, two universities. But, I, you know, if I yeah. ever got my PhD in art history, I'd be more than happy to teach that course. Um, yeah, but have you ever been in one of those colleges and taken one of those classes? They're always so contrived. They're like, we're going to look at modern film and it's like the most superficial take on it. So I just, I just imagine me sitting in a class and they're just like talking about Metal Gear and they're like, have very like, you know, and I'm just sitting there being like, uh, can you guys just go to snakesoup.org and look at our <laughs> articles? Cause this is all wrong. I have, I have sat in some, um, film classes and it's just like, they're like, you know, the Exorcist was actually about the war in Iraq. I'm like, I, I'm, I have to leave. Like, See, I can't do this. Yeah, I, I hate that kind of shit, right? I don't want to yeah. learn about, like, oh, like, Metal Gear Solid 4 is supposed to represent, like, Kojima, <laughs> his feeling about this. I want to hear, like, oh, well, you know, the developers of Mario realized that they could only fit in eight levels, so yes. they put in three lives because they didn't want people to get through the cartridge you know, by the end of the week. Like this is just did you know gaming.com. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would yeah, I would love I know that uh, there was a whole you, you guys remember when Red Bull did that series about video game music? It was pretty cool. They went over it wasn't in super detail because it was just like, you know, a short documentary series. They could only get in so much detail. But they went through all the different eras of video games and just tracked how music and video games evolved. Um, from being something that was like more, okay, we can do music in games, so let's just put in some tunes, right? To how it became more a bigger part of the experience. Yeah. And mm-hmm. and they went through all the different things and how oh, early, you know, like how the Street Fighter soundtrack was very, you know, interesting and how it was done and how insane it was that these people were essentially putting these uh, com- these complicated music pieces within chips that could only do so much. Yeah, you know, the limitations back, back then were crazy. Back, you had to be, you had to be an engineer and a musician, right? You, you couldn't just write it, write a thing, and make a MIDI file and put it in the game. You couldn't do that back then. Yeah, you had to make the chips sing. You know, I wonder if that's part of the reason that there is that difference in perception. Because when you look at films and movies, there is a higher level of accessibility in terms of getting into those areas and making your own stuff it's not as complicated. Whereas with games up until fairly recently, it's been sort of closed off unless you were an engineer or a developer 
and you understood these these deep concepts. You know, it's not it's not something where you can just grab a camera, get your friends and make a movie. You know, you have to you have to understand all of these underlying technologies to get it made. So it's it's more opaque. So I wonder if that's part of the reason it's not yeah. as as kind of seen in the same light as like movies and music. Well, and you also have to understand that, yes, music and mov- movies and all this stuff, it's very, you know, consumer based. It, it has to be. It's the nature of the thing. But uh, movies were also s- something that amateurs could do. And they were, you know, they they were related to photography and related to other things. So they could be seen as an extension of art. Um in the early days of movies, they were considered a toy product. I wrote an article about this, um, about uh, how people don't realize that about film history, that when films were new, they were not considered art. They were considered something you pay a penny for and watch some cowboys shoot each other. That's like, that was the, uh, that was, they were a product, they were a toy. And, uh, you know, and games are pretty much were that too. So when I complain about consumerism being an issue, I don't mean the inherent nature of the product that of course is a consumerist thing. But I feel like video games started from being something you buy, you know, next to a box of, you know, like a like Scrabble or something, right? They come from that. And I feel like because of that, there's a bit of a confusion in where, you know, how you look at that. Because, yes, people make art made games and it was artistic the same way some the guy who designed, uh, you know, Hungry Hungry Hippos was an artist, right? Technically, yes. But I feel like games are kind of still stuck in that weird thing where... Uh, there's a push and pull and how much of, of it it's a toy that is uh, something you should discard after you're done with it and how much of it is something you should you know preserve. That's the biggest issue with game preservation, right? Well, you know Hungry Hungry Hippos is actually about the war in Iraq. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. The, uh, the, the, the hippos represent the, uh, the industrial military complex. Con- consuming everything they and, can. And... Um, and the marbles are just our tax dollars just getting eaten exactly. up. Exactly. You know, it all makes sense. It mean, all, all makes sense, man. <laughs> just connect the dots. Look into it. The, the pink hippo is George H.W. Bush. Oh, no. <laughs> are we getting political? Uh, uh, so anyway, um, you know, speaking about the uh, articles you wrote, um, the most recent one I wanted to kind of touch on was uh, regarding PT because there's been quite a bit of talk about that recently. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. And how specifically the myth article on the snake soup talks about how PT is um, not a demo for Silent Hills, uh, as is often claimed, essentially. Yeah, that's been something that bothered me from the day it was a thing. Um, and I feel like it's something to be bothered by semantics, but I feel like by calling it a demo, there's been a lot of miscommunication, misconception online where how people perceive the game is very much different right because if you look at pt most of the time you'll 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 find articles on any site you know i'm not even saying any specific site um but they'll say oh you know pt demo for silent hill pt and that just gives a wrong impression of what the game's intent was and how it was made and everything so i feel like it seems like i'm just arguing semantics but i think it is important when you're you know when you're discussing something you need to know what you're talking about um you can call pt a demo it's a standalone game that was meant as a teaser you know for sound hills like they claim they they couldn't have put in more disclaimers <laughs> in the game and outside the game that this is not silent hills Silent hills will be completely different you know kojima gave many interviews where he repeated that where he said you know um silent hills is going to be completely different and honestly do you think he was going to get norman Reedus and have it be first person i don't think so yeah, that's. I mean, I think it, if that had been fully developed after that point, that yeah, the, the gameplay would have been completely switched up from that point. But that was just like a nice little way to introduce that universe. And yeah, it was a teaser, a right? Bit of the character stuff. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, like Kojima loves film, so he loves putting film or marketing logic in video game. And his whole idea was that this is like a mood piece. Like you know, maybe that final game isn't sure. like this. Maybe the story isn't even the same. Maybe Lisa won't be in it. I don't care. I'm just gonna make the standalone experience that should give you an idea of what we're working on. It's kind of like looking at Kojima's Pinterest board because he's been going on Pinterest and looking at and saving <laughs> pictures of monsters and you're, you're just looking at all the ideas that they've been experimenting with. Um, BT actually stands for Pinterest. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Big of true. Big of true. And yeah, but, really but being well, accurate about this stuff isn't going to get people to click into articles. No, not at all. Uh, that's been a thing that we accepted a long time ago that Snake Soup is not going to be, you know, a popular thing that we chase after. And um, 
you know, it's there, there are certain people who want to make that their, you know, full-time gig, right? They want to report on news and stuff. And, and, you know, I'm not even saying that's a bad thing. It's not something that, I mean, again, I can't speak for Robbie, but that's generally, that's not something we've been interested in. We have a bunch bigger, different hobbies outside of it in our lives. So this is something that's always been a side hobby, but in our side hobby, we try to be accurate and, you know, there's a lot of disinformation, you know, about video games, especially, right? Um, the, the the simple being reason being clickbait and everyone wants to be first. Um, I feel like with Snake Suit, we never got to that level because we always waited to get the accurate information before we reported on it. And by the time we, we had the accurate information, all the sites and all the YouTubers and stuff, I mean, you know, they had already made 50 videos about how something is something when it's not. I feel like that's something we've been fighting forever. And it's kind of sad because I feel like we I, we have lost that fight. Um, yeah, I, I can't stand YouTubers that just will take like that first little bit of an article and just be like, oh, got to run with this and just get that video out. And it's just like, damn it, man. you're you're At the end of the day, it like ends up fucking up game sales, you know, because yeah. they're either spreading misinformation about, you know, something that isn't even in the game. You know, and that, that's the part that I really don't like about it. Yeah, and I feel like it's very easy to just watch a quick video or whatever, and it's, you know, those people could do all that stuff, and people could look at it and say, well, I don't, you know, I don't believe that. But yeah. un- unfortunately, people, you know, generally don't seem to look beyond that. I feel like if I write a, write a myth article where I have sources and I, I do, you know, I really want to tell you this information, um, it's it's much easier to watch a video where a guy just says something, right? Unfortunately, yeah. and... um so that guy better have his shit straight. Yeah, well, that's the thing, right? And these people on YouTube to make money, they have to make like fifty videos, you know, a month. And yeah. uh, ten minutes and three you know, seconds. Each. Yeah, and if they want to get enough attention, yeah. they have to be first out of the gate. You have to be first out of the gate. They have to make outlandish claims and you know, oh, Sega is buying Konami. Oh, uh, uh Xbox is is buying Silent Hill. It's like it's based on nothing. I could I could make a rumor right now and it could be just considered fact and it's frustrating and I you know I I forget that people just take that for granted or people just believe that right I go on Twitter and it's you know Silent Hill is trending and everyone's like oh my god I can't believe that Xbox or Microsoft is buying Konami I'm like what and people are people as soon as people see that they accept it as fact it's like the first thing they see they accept as fact and we have to work for years to make them understand that that's not what's happening yeah that was sony they were talking about buying konami but yeah oh no 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 there was a microsoft thing too <laughs> yep oh okay well shit apparently everybody's buying konami yeah yeah everyone's buying everyone it's like it's oprah you know it's Konami's <laughs> like i'm not a piece of meat stop it you can't know, just have at me like this konami's a town bicycle yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah um I, I understand people's frustration they want it to be true so bad that they'll believe anything and I, and I get that, but I just, I don't understand why, you know, people think that if they believe in something hard enough, it'll become true. Yeah. And, and I've, that's a pattern I've noticed a lot with all this stuff. So yeah, no. Um, and I get people just not wanting Konami to be like sitting on these IPs. They're like, look, if you're not going to do something with it, let somebody do something with it. And that's, it's like, it's definitely wishful thinking. Like, exactly. I understand. It is, it is wishful thinking. I completely understand. Um, I don't understand stuff like people saying that, oh, you know, uh, Kojima should come back. It's like, dude spent 20 years getting away from Metal Gear. I don't want him to come back. You know, all that stuff. But And also, I feel like generally people have a very uh, m- bad understanding of how the industry works. Yes. They a very bad understanding of how development works. And they have a very bad understanding of, like, the economy of all of it. And they just think that, you know, I could just go in and go, um, I'll have one Sega, please. And like that's just it. I, yeah. If I'm if I'm rich enough, I can just buy a company. And it's like that's not how that works. Yeah. And if they had an understanding, these rumors probably wouldn't pick up as much. Yeah. I especially love it when like you see gamers like they go and they request like this massive fix. They're like, oh, why did you put in this small update when you could be making this big fix? And it's like, no, that's, yeah. that's not how development works. <laughs> yeah, it's not a zero sum game. We're working on it. Yeah. You know, people and- think that because the patchy slot exists, that means that some hypothetical Metal Gear Solid 3 remake in the Fox engine didn't get made because they did this instead. And, like, that's not how it works. Different teams. I have a I have a remake remake laptop right here. I put the disc in. 
I, I, I press remake <laughs> on the keyboard and it makes a remake. That's how it works. Metal Gear Solid remake confirmed. Clearly. You know, it's, it's like I've been seeing people talk about how I feel like people have a misunderstanding of how things work, but they run with it and they think they're knowledgeable. And I know that sounds maybe a bit, I don't know, asshole but people have bits and pieces of information. Everyone thinks they can read Wikipedia and be educated. And it's like, that's not how that works. I've been seeing well, a lot of people think that we are at the point of technology that we don't need people to localize games. We can put a script in an AI and it'll translate it. And I'm not even joking. I've seen this a lot recently. Yeah, it doesn't work. Well, a lot of the times you'll see people on, on Wikipedia citing articles that are opinion pieces that cited something else yep. on Wikipedia. And you have this this circular confirmation loop but because A confirmed B, B is confirmed by A, yep. and somehow that's a fact. You own both websites. It's like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, also, um, just so you guys know, uh, Snake Soup is not a credible source according to Wikipedia. It's just so you know. It's an opinion-based website. Yeah, meanwhile, you know, they can cite opinion pieces all day long, but Wikipedia, but, you know, they say that Snake Soup is not credible. Well, I mean, it, it sucks, like, when when people, like, reach out for confirmation or, like, hey, man, can you give me a source on this? And it's, like, you get this snarky attitude with a lot of these journalists yep. where they're just, like, hey, you got to just trust me on this one. Or they just fucking block you, like, at yep. any point. I think uh, we had an incident with that this week. Yeah, that was funny. Yep. I was, um, there's been a story going around about PT how because Sony released a list Sony released a list of PlayStation 4 games that would not be compatible on the PlayStation 5 if transferred or that wouldn't transfer one of the two I don't remember the specifics and PT was not on that list so people immediately began asking okay does that mean PT will work on the PS5 and no that's not necessarily what that means but that didn't stop several I counted 7 at least gaming websites, large ones. Oh, there's, that, more. Yeah, yeah, there's more. Yeah, that ran with the story, hey, PT's going to be compatible on PS5, confirmed, essentially. And, and like, they've got these clickbaity headlines, and if you read the article down to the to the grid of it, you can kind of see that they're like, well, we don't know for sure, but the, the damage is done. And, yep. and I pointed this, I, I called out one of the writers of these articles, and I was instantly blocked. Well, I'm, I'm very sad that I won't be able to play... TT Isle of Man right on the edge too on my PS5. <laughs> but yeah, their so their logic is that because PT isn't on there, that means that PT is on there. And it's like or like, you know, it, it works on PlayStation 4. It's like, why would they give consideration to a game that technically has been taken out? That game's feet have been like, you know, dried in concrete and it's been thrown in the ocean. Like that game does not exist. If you go to Konami and ask them about PT, they're like, well, I have never heard of PT. And they'll just like, oh, security, come get it. <laughs> like, it's <laughs> not something they talk about because that game represents something bad for the company. Because for both Sony and um, Konami, the biggest issue with PT is that it advertises a game that doesn't exist. It's as simple as that. Like, if, if, if PT was truly standalone in the sense that it didn't have, you know, it wasn't tied to Silent Hills in any way. I feel like they probably might not have taken that down. But because the whole existence of that game is to remind you that they are working on Silent Hills, they can't have that exist because Silent Hills doesn't exist. I think if people can somehow convince Konami, and I don't think it's possible, but I'm saying in a, you know, in, if things went you know, good, maybe you could convince Konami to re-release PT and remove all the Silent Hills stuff from it, right? Wipe any mention of Silent Hills as truly standalone. And I think that would, you know, that that could be a thing. I've talked to people who have told me that could be a thing, but I just, yeah, like they're not they're not going to talk about that game. It's not going to be on the list. If it works, it works. If it doesn't work, if it doesn't work, they're not going to they're not going to talk about it. It's just not going to happen. I mean, going back to your like, you know, keep comparing film and video games. It's like if they had a new, you know, a medium like a, a new type of Blu-ray disc or, or media format, and people are asking if they would. <laughs> port like an unfinished movie or, or upscale the movie to that new format like it's the movie doesn't exist yeah you can't upscale something that doesn't exist yeah it's the same thing and uh yeah i feel like i feel like with, with pt it's more so that it's the game it resides in a really strange point uh, like a really strange part of you know what because it was so unique as a teaser it's also come into a weird issue because of it because, like I said, if the game didn't have any mention of Silent Hills, I just don't think that game would have been taken off. But as it stands, it's like a game that kind of represents something that they failed on, for better or for worse. You know, like we don't know exactly what went down, and I'm not going to be one of those people who's going to be like, actually, you know, 
yeah, and again, that's part of the problem is when people make assumptions, they report conjecture as fact. Yeah, we 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 have uh, we have rumors, right? And we have guesses, and we can make educated guesses on what went down, but we we can't ever know what went down. And uh, unfortunately, that really helps conspiracy theorists, right? It's kind of funny that a game series that has a game like MGS2 um, really has like people like you know MGS2 was kind of like question everything, and people were like okay, <laughs> and that kind of created problems on its own. Um, I feel like people have taken that so to heart that they just don't want to believe anything. And that's why we have stuff like Never Be Game Over and stuff, which I also wrote an article against called Let It Be Game Over. Yeah, MGS2 sort of planted the seed for that attitude. For sure. And I just think that, like uh, like Fingers mentioned before, a lot of his wishful thinking, right? People want it to be true um, so bad. They want like this whole plot. You know, there's still people believing that even after Death Stranding came out, they still believe in the MG as zero thing or the or the, you know, weird, let, like, never be game over thing. They still think this is all a ploy by Konami and, and, like, Kojima to do something. Oh, I saw somebody talking about, you know, some big post on Facebook by a larger community being like, hey, is Chapter 3 still on the way? And, like, do you do you have hobbies outside of this? Do you, yeah. do you go outside? Chapter 3 is outside. Again, going back to, to actually, like, having a job in software development, I wish that big corporations were this interesting, where they had, like, these secret espionage projects, yep. and they were buying people, you know, behind closed doors as, like, an anime trap card or some shit like that. Unfortunately, <laughs> it's 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 not that interesting. Well, yeah, people romanticize it. They love these games so much, and they want the development and the background and, and everything outside and around these games that went into making them to be just as exciting as the games. So it's just, it's magical thinking. Yeah, and... Uh, I do find it funny that they think that a company like Konami would just become the punching bag of the world as a, some sort of ploy. Like, gotcha. We, we, we wanted you to, you know, write hashtag fuck Konami for like five years. Right. It's like, it's kind of it's kind of silly to think that. And people also, I feel like, don't understand how Japanese companies work. Where a Japanese company isn't going to do that. That just, you know, if you, even, even if you know just a little about how corporations in Japan work. They're just not going to play around with that kind of stuff, ever. Like, they often don't have a sense of humor. Yeah, you know, I remember I was reading a long time ago, there was a discussion whether who came up with the name Metal Gear, because we don't know exactly, uh, you know, do we have proof? I, to be, I shouldn't be repeating something that I haven't It's Gronin, seen. obviously. Oh, yeah, Gron- cr- cr- clearly. He was drunk <laughs> in his office, and he was just like, oh, Metal Gear, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, maybe, that, maybe that that's how it actually happened. Like, <laughs> Kojima was just throwing one back. He's like, I got an idea. No, but there was this, um, it's actually a misconception. This is like a mini-myth article right now. There's a misconception based on Wikipedia, which I feel like half the time I'm batting away misconceptions is because of Wikipedia. And... There's a line on, I think, Kojima's page that says that he took over development of Metal Gear from a senior associate. People interpret that as Metal Gear already existed and Kojima came in, but the, the, that doesn't seem like what happened. What they mean is that there, must have, there might have been a project that was already going around and Kojima got it and then he changed it into Metal Gear. The misconception might, is that Metal Gear already existed and then they just handed it over to Kojima. I don't think that's what happened. It's similar to Demon Souls, where they already kind of had an idea, but when Miyazaki took over that game, he just completely changed it and made his own thing. I think that's probably what happened. Again, it sounds like a scenario where people just like don't understand software development. Like yeah. it just could have been a, a matter of people, you know, recycling code. I feel like it was it was especially for video game back video games back then. They were like, we need an army type game. So this is the army type game project. And it eventually came to Kojima and he was like, oh, I mean, what if our, what if army's bad? <laughs> what if, what if I don't, we, what if we don't fight? And they're like, okay, okay, dude, <laughs> like make this game. You got, you, you got a month. <laughs> yep. Didn't you work on that penguin game? Oh, well, well sure. Cool. Whatever. <laughs> I'm trying to remember the specifics, but that's essentially what it was. Uh, they were going to make some kind of an action game. Internally, they were calling it Project N3. Like, the, the internal designation was N312. And it was supposed to be an action game like... There was some old... I think it was Commando, is what it was. Um, hmm. Which was a, a game that came out in 1985. And it's just an overhead shooter, right? It's like a Capcom title. 
And the initial plan was to make a game that kind of replicated that experience. Konami wanted their own type of action game like that. And when Kojima took it over, he was like, ah, this is going to be really difficult on this hardware. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's do something a little bit. Yeah. I mean, the, the stealth element on that stuff was clearly born out of limitation, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. I've so, definitely read that it was hardware limitation based on that for sure. Uh, you know, too. which is cool. Um, I, 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 I had written a myth article about, uh, the, I think the last one that I specifically wrote was a very, again, this is the most basic misconception, but I had gotten tired of, of seeing it for like, you know, for over 20 years where people still don't know the difference between the Metal Gear NES and Metal Gear MSX. And yeah. a big issue with that is, again, Wikipedia. I'm sorry, I keep coming back to that. But Wikipedia lists them both as the same game. They're not. But Wikipedia does that for a lot of games where they'll say Tony Hawk Pro Skater on PlayStation and Game Boy. And it's like, yeah, those are not the same games. You can't say that. Yeah, definitely different. Uh, you know, uh, when they made the NES version, right, it was really interesting because people give that game a lot of shit, and so do I as a joke, but the team did the best they could. Konami gave them, like, three months to make that game. Shit. And I believe it was, like, three or four months, something like that. And they couldn't do those things in that time. I doubt they could ever do them on the NES the same way. That's why they made the changes that they did. And considering the, the short amount of time they had, when you think about that, it's like they did a really phenomenal job, all things considered, right? Yeah. And uh, according to this interview that I that was um, that was translated, um, that I was reading when I was writing that article, Konami had also requested that that game just be different. And I don't know why they said this, but according to the developer or the director of that game, I believe, they they're specifically requested that we want this game to be different. And also, can you do it in three months? <laughs> Damn. So yeah, and you know, so like we were saying, like there's there's a lot that goes behind the scenes that people don't realize. They wanted a game out that year that they, for for the U.S. right because it was put out under the Ultra Games like um, you know Shell Corporation that Konami had at the time in the U.S. Mm-hmm. And uh, they had a number of games they needed to hit every year. Their whole reason that Konami made Ultra Games was because Nintendo at the time had a limitation. To, uh, according to Nintendo, it was to avoid shovelware, where um, a company could only put out like three games a year. And so Konami made a shell corporation. So they could make more. <laughs> they could make more. So they could, they, make, they could make six. That's awesome. So Ultra Games so Ultra, so Ultra Games just wanted to fill that order, right? So they're like, oh shit. Yeah, isn't you- there an article on Ultra Games on Snake Soup? It's like Ultra Games, Konami's like hangover. What is there? Yeah. See now, now you're catching. Okay, there might be. I, there's a lot of stuff I forget that we have on there. Ultra Games: The Aftermath of Konami's Hangover. Yep. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Neo Tales is the author of that one. Yeah. This is this is before I was contr- contributing to the site. So 2003. This, yeah. Yep. Snake Soup goes back far. That's for sure. Yeah. I can't but, believe I remembered that. Sorry, yeah, deep cut. Right? Deep cut. Yeah, you, yeah, you, you like stump me for a second. People don't understand that it's like you know, things like that happen, and you have to look at look at them from that perspective. The reason they likely wanted Metal Gear to be out that year because they looked at the numbers. They said, "Well, this game sold well in Japan on the MSX2, and so we want we want one on the NES and put it out, you know, in the West. And you know, we need to fill this quarter. We need a new game out. So just you just churn something out. We got to have it out." Um, it's something as simple as that, right? And Snake's Revenge, you know, was also a similar thing where they're like, well, you know, the first game did well enough. Let's just make a sequel. They didn't care at back then if the yeah. sequel was the same. Like, you know, Mario 2 was, you know, Mario 2 was wildly different, you know? Zelda. Uh, the concept didn't exist to make an exact sequel. They were just throwing crap on the wall. You know, it kind of reminds me of, of in movies, how Planet of the Apes, the sequel to that. At the time, they didn't really make sequels that much, or in, especially of that magnitude. So they were like, ah, oh, how do sequels work? I don't know. Uh, I guess it's a different story. Same people. Planet of the Apes starts with a recap of the ending of the first movie just because they weren't familiar with the concept of, you know, sequels to that. I guess we have to put a whole recap in there and yeah. re- redo the ending. So I, they were back then, they were just putting out products, right? Um, Snake's Revenge is, you know, a good thing that happened at the end of the day because it, 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 it uh, encouraged Koji- uh, Kojima to make Metal Gear 2. The, the whole story behind Metal Gear 2 happening is a train ride. Where, like, Kojima talked to, uh, uh, you know, someone, I'm, I'm misremembering the story a bit, 
where they said, you know, they're making like a second Metal Gear game in, you know, in, in for the West with Snake's Revenge 2. Why didn't you make something like that? You know, you could, and he was encouraged to do that. So Snake's Revenge literally made Metal Gear as a series happen. Yeah, I heard it was a variation of that where if someone said they enjoyed playing Snake's Revenge and he was like, wait, what? I don't think so. no. I it was. I don't think he even knew. He was on a train ride. I'm just saying, there's multiple versions of the story. Like, yeah, the story as Kojima told it was that he rode the train home, and one of the uh, developers, he was either the lead developer or one of the developers, told Kojima about Snake's Revenge and said, you know, I realize this isn't what you would have done. I would like to see what you would do with a sequel, and. Kojima says he had the, the the concept for Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake worked out before he even got off the train and then the very next day went to his boss with the rough outline. Gotcha. So Snake's Revenge had already come out at that yes. point. Yeah. I guess that's the that's the thing. Cool. I had a bit of a shower thought though. Is is the Metal Gear port to NES like the first one of the first examples of like, you know, how everybody always talks about those ports to from PC games to consoles that are like really bad. Um uh, is this like the first example of that? No, there were definitely some that were from arcade games that uh, and I wouldn't right. call. I wouldn't call Metal Gear NES support. It's like more like a remake or a demake, if you want to call it that. Yeah, because uh, it's a completely different game, right? But it's like a remake. It's kind of weird to call it a remake, but it is. That's what it is, right? <laughs> Metal Gear was the first remake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's. It's more akin to like like Pac Man on the it, It's the first something. We're gonna figure it out. It's the first something. <laughs> We're gonna figure it out. <laughs> but it's more akin to like days? I was to say it's, it's more akin to like Pac Man on the Atari, where they wanted to try to recreate this experience on on a, a higher like something with much more limitations. Yeah, and it's similar where they gave them like, you know, a day to make it essentially. <laughs> They're like, okay, you gotta make Pac Man, I gotta have it by five on my desk. Yeah, that's what's um, fucked up. They started on, like, higher... That's like them making a PS5 game and then, them, like, handing them a PS2 and be like, hey, could you could you pull this off on this, though? It's like, what the... No. Well, that happened back in the day. So, you know, nowadays we have this idea of video game generations consoles, right? Back then, it, back then it wasn't the same way. Uh, things were back and forth. So one of my favorite games that ever exists on is, um, is on the Genesis. It's Castle of Illusion starring Mickey Mouse. It's. Mm-hmm. I'm not even a big Disney person. I just lo- really love that game. Yeah, it was a good game. But that game was also made for the Master System later. Yep. So that used to happen a lot where they would come out with the game on a on a higher system or like a better system, if you want to put it that way. But they would say, well, you know, a certain percentage of our audience still or our customer base still has the old yeah, one. Yeah, exactly. Because the concept of going ahead, going out and buying a new one, when I was a kid, that wasn't a thing. Like, you still had an NES, you know? Yeah. You... You like just didn't throw away your old thing for the new one. That didn't really happen back then. So yeah, they they did that often actually, where they would just even and when you consider like portable versions of games, like I was mentioning Tony Hawk, that was similar, right? They mm-hmm. made a Tony Hawk for PS One. They're like, well, we got Tony Hawk. I, I I would hate to be the kid, right, who had to play Tony Hawk on the Game Boy because he didn't have it like Shit. a PlayStation. I was I was also thinking of a uh, Tony Hawk on the Engage. Oh jeez! Oh dude! Yeah. Oh, like, we can get into. That, I mean, there's a, that thing for like five seconds, dude. We have Tony Hawk at home. <laughs> yeah, I, I wish. <laughs> I, Nitro and I were talking about this. There are people who are working on an N-Gage emulator finally, and so there will there might be in a future a way to play Metal Gear Mobile or Metal Gear Solid Mobile, which is a relatively unknown game, considering it came out like. When you think of an N-Gage game, you think early 2000s. No, that game came out in 2006 or 7, I believe, or maybe later. Maybe it was 8. So just to be um, a little specific about it, it's specifically sure, it's a ahead. Symbian emulator, which is yeah, yeah. Um, like a mobile OS. And N-Gage, I believe, used a build of Symbian. So the idea is with a sufficient Symbian emulator, you could emulate N-Gage games as well. Now, there were a couple of, believe it or not, there were actually like two generations of N-Gage. So... Yeah. Um, they've been able to get, I believe it's called EKA 2L1 and it's still a fairly active, um, uh, development scene. Like they've got a discord community and everything set up and apparently they are bombarded regularly by people who want to know, Hey, is Metal Gear Solid mobile playable yet? And they're just, they're like, Ugh, we, we please stop. Like, dude, we haven't even, we haven't even finished Engage one and that's an Engage two game. 
before you brought that up, I was going to say I'm going to go to the Discord and just like just to start typing Melger, Melger's on mobile when, Melger's on mobile when. I'm just going <laughs> to. Like, I think it's even a pinned post on their Discord. I, I might be wrong about that, but I remember going in there to, to find more information and just seeing a lot of eye rolling. Um, but they're making a lot of progress, and there's a lot of Symbian and Engage games that do work. And uh, I actually do think that Tony Hawk is one of them. I think I remember seeing like okay. a. Um, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave right now and <laughs> boot that up. <laughs> I'm gonna play Tony Hawk and the End Gauge on my computer on my 4K screen. That's all I wanted to do. But it's cool that there's a community out there working on this. So maybe someday, they, if they get to that point, it'll be playable. At the moment, the only way to play Metal Gear Solid Mobile is if you've got essentially the ROM and a compatible device, which is like yeah, either the N-Gage or one of the many phones. And even then you're going to need the right build of the game to run. Yeah. And it's very, it's uh, much harder than you think to get an N-Gage and have it work. I have looked into it because I kind of wanted to write a review for a while about that game. Cause I thought it'd be interesting because no one talks about that game. So it'd be interesting to talk about it. Um, that game is very unique. It has a unique story. It's like, uh, it's, it's similar to like, like ghost babble, in a way, where it's kind of its own offshoot spin-off story. It's still in continuity with one of the games, but it's its own thing at the same time. Yeah, it's like a prequel to MGS2 of sorts. It's not like an official one, but it's it's taking place like right before MGS2. And like, uh, yeah, I won't spoil it if anyone wants to go through the trouble of figuring out how to play it. Yeah, yeah, it's the it, it's, it's one of those games when you say what the whole point is, you just ruin the whole thing. Right, but it had um, some interesting mechanics too where you could like, take photos and it'll extract the color that's most dominant in the photo and change your sneaking suit to match that color so that you can hide. So it's like an early Octo Camo. Speaking of uh, gameplay systems that are interesting, uh, Peace Day never came, y'all. Uh, <laughs> we kind of got screwed over here. On the PS3, uh, we got an official tweet from the Metal Gear account. So apparently people were just hacking, I guess. <laughs> How many times is this now? <laughs> yeah, I don't think we're ever going to get Peace Day. Y'all keep nope. fucking it up for everybody. It never came. Peace Day never coming is like actually very much in line with Metal Gear. Yeah, it's pretty on brand. I think I was going to say it's especially on brand that we have these sort of like false showings of peace. I don't know what to call it. Like these <laughs> celebrations that are just a, a giant facade that we discovered later on when we're more miserable. <laughs> yeah, it's... It's it's a uh, it's actually Hot Coldman. He's been behind this whole thing this whole time. He keeps making up, you know. He keeps lulling us into false sense of security so he can launch the nukes. <laughs> <laughs> There's been nukes the whole time. Always has been. <laughs> Last week we had Adam online on, and we were talking about the Metal Gear uh, Solid PC port and how the music is all janky and you know the loop points are all weird. And uh, we had said that uh, there was no fix for that, but apparently there is a fan fix uh, from the speedrun community member BMN. Um, we'll put a link in the description for that if you want to try it out and mess around. Uh, you know, it just looks like a simple zip file. Um, but yeah, just to be clear and uh correct what we said last time because we care about accuracy here on the kojima frequency shout out to at plywood gaming for sending that in why is crash 4 on this list because <laughs> that's we normally just like talk about what we've been playing and yeah, stuff okay. like if we yeah no, right no i know i guess i mean i mean i, I do listen to your guys thing uh but yeah. yeah i guess it's just funny to me to see all the metal gear shit and just see crash 4 i'm like okay <laughs> Yeah, people that play Crash 4 and like 100% it are fucking psychos. I just beat that over the weekend. And uh, Oh, so uh, did you like it? It seems like a game I would play for like two days and then never touch again. Yeah, I mean, I played through it with no interest of like, I, was, I, I enjoyed it more because I didn't care about any of the trophies, any of the completion rates, any of the costumes. I was like, cool, I'm just going to play through it and whatever crates I get. Oh, awesome. Don't get me started and, on like, trophies. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the yeah. PS5 UI is going to be featuring them, but we'll talk about that next week on the Kojima <laughs> Frequency. <laughs> yeah. I uh, <laughs> Maxwell, where can people find you if you want to plug your stuff? Sure. I mean, just go to at the Snake Soup on Twitter or go to thesnakesoup.org. Um, you can also find us on Facebook, same name. And yeah, that's the best place. We, you know, you'll find a lot of shit posts. You'll find us retweeting information that we find. You know, we, we follow. There's a, there's a great amount of the Metal Gear fan base that is all about trying to find old information from interviews and translations and you know i i really like that part of the kojima uh fan base i should say not the Melgear fan base and you know we we like try really hard 
to encourage people to go play Metal Gear 1 and 2, because most people haven't. Go play Police Nods, go play Snatcher. Uh, for us personally, those are some of our favorite games. Um, so yeah, if you want, if you like that kind of stuff, you like looking at that kind of that kind of thing, yeah, give us a follow. If you like our shit posts, go to Snake Soup because Snake Soup retweets some of our shit posts. Yeah, once again, that's the snakesoup.org. Yeah, there you go. Longtime friends of the podcast for sure. All right, buddy. Well, thanks for coming on. We appreciate it. Yeah, anytime, man. Yeah, yeah glad we got a chance to talk. I'll probably talk to you again here in a few minutes. <laughs>